welcome to the Empowered Curiosity Podcast. This week's podcast is going to be just like a gigantic love fest. I think whenever Nadine and I get together, it turns into like, like we've never actually seen each other in person, but like we end up just having like a verbal cuddle puddle, it feels like. So that's what today is going to be about. Um, But For those of you who are listening and aren't just interested in the cuddle puddle part, um, (laughs) let me give you a little bit of a background of Nadine and why I've asked her onto the podcast. So Nadine is the creator of Save a Million Cents. Um, She is a money and life coach who empowers her communities to better understand their relationship with money. She believes that observing how money can ultimately prevent us from moving forward and creating a bigger impact in our world. Um, Nadine is somebody who takes that idea and nurtures each journey towards healing money wounds with informed awareness and curiosity. And she does that all while fostering freedom, alignment, and purpose. And through acknowledging the money wounds that we all have and carry, we are able to heal and integrate shadow aspects of ourselves, leading us to more love, self-discovery, clarity, and compassion. As a byproduct of healing, money can become your friend, a confidant, and an ally that strengthens your journey towards courage, authenticity, joy, freedom, and purpose. So, as you can tell, Nadine is not just another financial coach who's going to teach you how to budget and teach you, you know, these like very structured ways. (laughs) She's like giggling over there. (laughs) Um... (laughs) It's almost like funny to think about, right? Um, Because like money holds such a deep energetic resonance and it holds such a deep and powerful medicine for so many people by being confronting. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about your work. And um, that's also why I've asked Nadine to help me co-teach the upcoming workshop called The Energetics of Money. Uh, So she's going to be one of our featured teachers on that. And I'm so excited to not just um, be a co-creator with her, but also to learn from her. Um, I've personally worked through so many of my own money wounds, and uh, I know that there is deeper and deeper work that I could always be doing. So thank you so much for being here, Nadine. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, (laughs) really, really happy to be here, honestly. (laughs) I'm like giggling like a little schoolgirl. Like, yay, my favorite podcast, I'm here. Yeah. (laughs) That's kind of what happens when we get together, though. It's true, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So... I would love, um, just because I think that your story around money is such a powerful one and such a transformative one, I'd love for you to start with just getting into why money has become this portal for for deep medicine and healing for you and your life and, and how that has opened up your capacity to hold space for other people. For me, um, I was confronted with the idea of money early on and in a different way. So I was born and raised in Jordan and I had a lot of financial abuse growing up in the house. So I didn't know it was that at the time. It was mostly emotional, sorry, physical abuse. Um, Sorry, as in if my family members heard, like, yeah, I'm talking about it. (laughs) And... um, When I later on grew up and started learning more about money, I realized that there was a fair bit of financial abuse. But lucky for me, I was able to leave Jordan at the age of 23 and move on my own to Australia. And being an Arab and being a Middle Eastern woman, it was it's not easy back then for me to just leave the house and live on my own. I had to actually leave the country to live on my own. And it went from living in my father's house to living completely just like (laughs) like a free range chicken in the middle of Australia. It was very confronting and I had to make money work for me. Um, The thing was at the time um, I was on a student visa and I was only allowed to work 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So not only was money tight, but 
the amount of work I was able to legally do was also tight. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know at the time, but I packed with me the um, manifestations of the financial abuse that I suffered through as a child. So, you know, you pack your clothes and you don't know how much emotional crap you actually put in that suitcase until Mm -hmm. I opened it and everything just came like just flying out. So for me, it was never an issue of overspending. For me, it used to be an issue of hoarding money, like Mm -hmm. holding onto money too tightly. And it's because at the time, money was my savior. So I fully acknowledge that to sit around and talk about money as like as money wounds or as a portal to healing, that is something that we access when we're feeling safe and feeling explorative. And at the time, it was not something that I had the luxury of accessing because money back then was my savior. It -hmm. was either you get that money to eat or you die, pretty much. So there wasn't much space for creativity around like, hmm, let me take a look at how I feel. So sometimes when I talk about exploring our money wounds or exploring our money blocks creatively, I do always have this like disclaimer, this is really a luxury to do because it really is a core survival issue because money will buy you shelter and food and clothes and all of these things because it's 2022 you know like of course you can get these things from other sources but having money or not having money is really linked to your survival as a as a human being it's linked to that instinctive fight flight freeze you know all of that so for me it was me always being in um, fight mode with money, like I'm always fighting with it. It's always, I had to ask permission for money. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, I want to do this. Uh uh-uh, uh, hang on, I can't do that because money, because money, because money. And I thought that not spending money was such a good idea. Like, oh, I am so savvy with money because I'm not spending it. And little did I know that that was just like very negative I had negative impacts on many different levels first of all my health because I was just opting for whatever's on special you know at the supermarket for example um, ignoring any physical symptoms that I might be suffering from because if I go to the doctor money um, ignoring um, things that cost money just because I would wish they would go away or you know solve problems by going the long way around just to solve a few like just to save a few bucks right Mm -hmm. and little did i know that that also had a bigger impact on my sense of fulfillment so for me holding myself back from spending also held myself back from doing things that actually my soul were was like crying out for me to do Mm -hmm. so whether it was staying in a job because it's cushy and it's safe whether it's not pursuing a hobby or a curiosity or something that just, you know, like tickles my fancy just because it costs money. And it was just like, I only, like later on, as I grew older in my 30s, I only allowed myself to travel. So it was either like hoard money, hoard money, hoard money, and then travel and then come Mm -hmm. back and do that cycle again. But then um, 2015, I had a major breakdown slash awakening. You know, they always, they always feel the same. Yeah. <laughs> They're always like, is this a breakdown or something? something's changing? Um, yeah. I was living in Australia and I was in New Orleans. And um, just I, I, have, I still can't explain what happened. Something just came down on me and I just started seeing money differently. It was like the Holy Spirit came down. I don't know what it was, but it was like, (laughs) I just saw everything clearly in front of me and how our values are a bridge between our soul and what our soul wants to do. Mm -hmm. So the the values that we we hold so near and dear, they need to be honored. Obviously, Mm -hmm. we can't use all our money to, to, you know, support these values because we need to you pay the water bill and all of that but you know you can link them back to values cleanliness hygiene but in what i'm saying i'm trying to say is that i just so clearly how money is it's a vehicle yeah. that takes us to to our life purpose our 
what are, what we are born to do mm-hmm. and the train tracks are the values that we're on mm. if that makes sense <laughs> it does it does and i love being able to take the the stigma and the shame and the guilt around these topics whether it's money or food or body image like like whatever it is that we're working with and giving them a bit of like a neutral tone to that I love how you make this into a neutral space by saying that money is a vehicle and really the most important part of that sentence of money is a vehicle to your values is the values part. And so if we can look at money as um, intentionality and like, you know, my audience hopefully by now has like a sense of what yin versus yang is. Um, if we can root the values to your yin and your intentionality and then money gets to then do the yang thing which is it helps you take aligned action towards those things that you value and you know i Mm -hmm. i think just knowing your story in depth and understanding that if this you know i i sometimes like feel like i i'm talking to like an inner child version of you Of like, if this little girl who grew up with all of these things against her in Jordan can understand and develop a relationship with money so that she's successful by whatever means you, you know, ascribe success to, um, both internally and externally, like it gives me the hope that like, yeah, I can do that too. Like it helps my inner child be a little bit braver about it. Um, and so I think that like, I just want to pay homage to your inner child and all the work that she's done to, to work through these old belief systems and all these old stories around money so that the adult you can actually be nourished by your life. Yeah. She's a brave little child. I mean, she went through a lot and that's the thing. It's exactly what you said. If and I always say that if this little girl, girl from Jordan can do what I can do, everybody can do what I can mm. do. Mm-hmm. And what I refer to as I can do is not like rolling around in money and living in mansions. Nothing wrong with that. But for me, it's more of a measure of fulfillment and a measure of being in alignment with our values and our life purpose. Because that is why we're born. I truly, truly believe that we're all put on put on this earth to serve a purpose and if we just bypass that if we get too busy with bullshit Mm -hmm. you're always going to be running around and chasing crap yeah and absolutely fortunately we understand that and fortunately more and more people are understanding that I am seeing that there is this like uh, collective awakening that's happening and that's what we actually need because um, from my point of view, all the destruction that is happening is due to unfulfillment. All the greed and all of that is due to unfulfillment. It's not due to money. Money is not oh evil or like, oh my God, money is so good. (laughs) Money is just like sitting there going, hey y'all, I'm just here. Stop just stop talking shit about me. I can help you do stuff because that's where we live now and you kind of need me and I need you and let's like work together and do something cool. Stop yeah. talking shit about me, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, with that, what I find so refreshing is about you and your work specifically around money is, you know, you're not coaching people to, you know, check off this like to-do list. I feel like when I first started getting curious about how to quote unquote manage my money, I don't like using that word anymore, which is why I said quote unquote. Um, I fell into Dave Ramsey's work and he gives you like this like 10 point checklist of like, okay, so now you, you, you open up this kind of card and you set up this, 
system to make sure that your credit cards are paid and then you snowball each like amount of debt down and there's so much rigidity in how we look at managing and controlling money and so many of those systems you know Dave Ramsey is just one of many 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 people who talk about money um so many of those systems has taken the spirit and the sovereignty and the like values of the person who's receiving that information out of the equation. And there's not a lot of curiosity around, okay, so what are your intentions and what are your goals? And they are so unique and different to you. And how can I help you set up a system that works for you versus you have to do this system because it's worked for tens of thousands of other people to get this level of idealized success that looks very, very, very similar on the outside to everybody else. It's like, you know, I don't know if you've been on Dave Ramsey's page at any point, but like, it's like, you know, very happy, not very diverse people, (laughs) um, holding up signs of like, I paid off my debt and it was this much and this amount of time. And, you know, we bought our house and it was this much and in this amount of time. And I feel like, like there's almost this like subscribed idea of like what our markers of success are. Mm -hmm. And I want you to just share a little bit about like, this idea of success being tied to fulfillment versus it being tied to these, um, like almost like we have to get into the car and the game of life and go get the car, the kid, the husband, the wife, the, you know, the white picket fence, the house in the suburbs, like, like talk to me about like, like what that is like to hold such a unique goal and process for each of your clients so um excuse me this prescribed um way of making money oh sorry saving money or managing money right it kind of is very detrimental to our well-being as a collective because it's exactly what you said this method worked for millions of people what does that say if it doesn't work for you sorry, you're out, (laughs) you know, like Mm. it doesn't work for you. So sorry, you're probably bad at money. So what happens is that people just, it doesn't work for them because their soul is way bigger than the seven step or whatever steps that are just prescribed out there. Right. And you know, it might work for a month. It might work for two months. It might, might, might work even for a year. But as I said, your soul's too big for that. And you start falling off the wagon because you need more you need there is more to life and you know that Mm -hmm. and then you start announcing to yourself or repeating to yourself and others i'm just bad at money and what happens it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna just buy that because i'm bad with money who cares i'm just gonna be in debt because i'm bad with money who cares and then these these systems or these ways of thinking actually make things that are neutral sound really negative. You know, mm-hmm. debt is bad. I mean, yeah, it's not great, but come on. Like, I always encourage my clients who have debt to rename their debt and give it a different energy. Like, it could this debt could have helped you fund the business of your dreams. This debt could have helped you bury a loved one. This debt could have helped your ass get out of trouble. Like, mm-hmm. don't just demonize the debt. Thank it yes pay it off i'm not gonna like sit here and say let's just look at it and like twiddle our thumbs we're gonna pay it off right but (laughs) we're gonna pay it off with gratitude and grace and not with like fuck me i have debt oh i'm bad so these are the dangers of subscribing to such um ways of thinking around money and that's you know like i do like to give my clients an option of what money management system they like to follow so yeah. working with me it's it we barely ever touch budgets or any of that I like to mm-hmm. show them how there is a system that is very um, 
well, there's a few systems that's, that's very successful for creative people because it is like 1 million percent flexible and you can do whatever okay. the heck you want. It's just the idea of it is having clarity around what's coming in and what's coming out. But mm-hmm. then we cultivate that into the intentionality of money and where yeah. that money goes. So going yeah. back to your yin and yang, um, what you were saying earlier, talking about money in that way, in like the... Dave Ramsey way and that like the traditional way so it it has its benefits there are people out there in the world that need to hear that or need to subscribe to something like that because that's the beginning that's the beginning of their financial journey so Mm -hmm. we all start at different um, stages obviously but then the danger is that we completely forego or ignore things that are unconventional that are within us because we're we all have something within us that's just like i want this and you're like why that's not something acceptable i'm not going to do this i'm not going to like leave everything and go to i don't know stockholm and like travel for a year like that doesn't make sense so that doesn't really um mm. encourage you to do crazy shit what's the point of life if you can't do crazy shit <laughs> right <laughs> This is why I think I I love your work because like on some level, like I know and I carry debt from student loans and I carry debt from my divorce and thank you already for that little nugget because um, I still am paying off my divorce and I am so grateful for that debt because it helped me get out of a situation that you know, I knew wasn't right for me. Um, And lawyer fees are expensive. And I didn't have a savings to be able to pay a lawyer. And so took out a line of credit. And so I'm so like, I think I had been holding gratitude in my heart for that, that credit card, but I also don't know that I named it as such. So I appreciate you already landing in with like a little piece of, um, of medicine there. Um, but I also, hmm, I think that a big part of why those systems don't work for some people is exactly what you were talking about is there are people who want to leave a or live a creative life who want to live an unconventional life and so you know I feel like I I want to say outgrew the Dave Ramsey system pretty early on because I was like I don't really want to buy a house in a neighborhood in the suburbs like can we talk about some alternative options of what my life can look like? And there was never room for that. And so part of my own personal money journey has been actually owning the fact that my life looks a little bit crazy from the outset, you know, and loving and embracing that. I am just about to leave Nevada and the plan is to live out of my trailer for a year, maybe two years until I find the perfect piece of land that I'm going to plant my roots into and just build a ranch and run a farm and a rescue, like a rescue animal operation out of. So like that never fit in with Dave Ramsey's style of, of mark money management. And I think that this is exactly the right person to be speaking to spiritual entrepreneurs because so much of us are leaving boxes behind, you know, so many of us are leaving behind systems, the traditional nine to five, these places where we were asked to be small. We were asked to fawn and fit in. We were asked to mold ourselves to, and that doesn't really work for us in work and so why would our relationship to money be any different oh my goodness yes everything you said yes i'm just like sitting here like a bobblehead <laughs> <Doing> <laughs> thing like yes yes preach it 
<laughs> yeah, why should it be? Why should our relationship to money follow somebody else's agenda? Why can't mm-hmm. we march to the beat of our own crazy ass drum? Serious, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and that's something that um, you know I do get people on discovery calls with me, and I tell them what I'm about, and they're like, mm, "Okay." <laughs> I'm like, all right, bye. <laughs> you know, people just believe that there's, there's one way to do things. And then there's other people that used to believe that there's one way to do things. Because we, again, like we all start at a certain block or a certain level. But then our soul just tells us things. See, here's the thing. All of us have a message from our soul. All of us have a life purpose, Right. But it's that clarity to honor that little voice that says, let's do this. Mm -hmm. It's having that mental clarity to think that, okay, hang on a second. It's telling me something. What is it that I'm curious about? Mm -hmm. And that's when it starts. When you have a money plan that offers, because some of these things that you're curious about don't really cost money, but some do. See, the ones that cost money, like travel or like go here or like quit or like start a business, you know, these things do need some kind of money and we ignore them because they just don't fit into that prescription budget that we're given. Mm-hmm. And we ha- when we have more leniency, when we have more space in our money management system to reflect our creative souls, that's when things start to shift in your life. Yeah. So offering that space in with your money, with your relationship to money is one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is also healing your money wounds because they hold so much wisdom and awesomeness in them, even though they hurt now. But once you dive in, once you have that courage and the guidance to dive into money wounds, you're going to unlock so much within you because Mm -hmm. then you will for real, for real start developing your own money rules and how your relationship with money will look like. But that's not based on an external factor. It is based on your internal factors. It's based on your personality. It's based on what your soul wants. Again, I keep talking about that because that's the most important thing. It's also based on your own upbringing and personal money trauma because money trauma or like the core beliefs that we have around money, they don't come from a traumatic dramatic event they come from teeny tiny mundane circumstances and as children we just internalize and and understand things in a way that's simple but that is the foundation of our core core beliefs about ourselves and about our relationship to money or money as an external factor yeah so for example if you go to the toy store and your father says, oh, um, you're only allowed one toy for the next year. That is something that might later on create this, like it will manifest into I'm indecisive with money decisions. I can't make a decision. Therefore, I'm going to put my head in the sand and make, and get somebody else to decide for me. Just mm-hmm. because as a child, you were you had so much pressure on you to choose that perfect doll because we don't have money and we're not coming back to the toy store in a year Mm -hmm. so it's like big things and also mundane things that create our core beliefs around money that manifest in our adult life Mm -hmm. and that they can hold us back from doing whatever the heck we want to do yeah absolutely and thank you so much for naming that because i think that oftentimes we think about wounds and traumas as being these like big events that happen in life and you're right when it comes to money specifically I find that it is related to resources sometimes it's not even as obvious as the like you're allowed to have one toy at the toy store and that being related to money sometimes it is um you know my parents felt like I needed to perform in order for me to receive love and attention. Mm -hmm. And so therefore I feel like I have to perform and work will always be really hard. And, you know, if I make money, there's a sacrifice of myself or there's a sacrifice of my energy or there's a sacrifice of like who I am in order to get that money. 
And so, like, it can be in these really sort of slippery ways Mm -hmm. when it comes to money and how it shows up. Oh, Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, And so having somebody who can sit and hold space and just observe those things with you because there's so much shame wrapped up in talking about money Mm -hmm. and I think you posted on your Instagram a little while back of like do you feel more comfortable talking about sex or do you feel more comfortable talking about money and I don't remember exactly what the percentage was but it was it was wild yeah it was wild um I think I had one person say money and that was an (laughs) ex-client a former (laughs) client of mine and I was like yeah you better (laughs) but I I think it was like most of the answers were sex 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 and yeah it's true so many people are so awkward to ask a friend about how they just something simple like how did you save for your down payment or how did you you know how much did this cost you know how much did it cost to buy this house because I would like to buy something similar Mm -hmm. things like that just the shame around money I just don't really understand it even growing Mm -hmm. up like don't talk about religion don't talk about money or politics Mm -hmm. yeah I understand these other two they're quite volatile but now that we're all adults and we're all wanting a little bit more out of life um, talking about money is actually a portal to further freedom because it will help you free yourself from the things that are holding you back because your money wounds come out of the same foundations. If we look at your life as a tree and one of the branches is a money wound, the foundation of the tree or the, the, whatever you're feeding that tree is your core beliefs and your core wounds as a child. Mm -hmm. And again, Mm -hmm. it didn't need to be a traumatic childhood, just teeny tiny things that you misunderstood or you were misfed, let's say, (laughs) that perpetuate and manifest into things that sabotage you pretty much yeah but they're not all bad there is so much light behind the dark Mm -hmm. so much light Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. actually too bright behind the dark it's just we need people or we all need to sit in that dark tunnel a little bit longer because oftentimes we leave the tunnel too early and the light is just there Mm. it's like just there and we're like no 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 too scary and we leave and we miss the whole the gift and opportunity and the beauty of the pain that is there because there is a lot of beauty in pain absolutely absolutely um what that's bringing up for me as you're you're sitting here speaking is this deep wound that i had around money and capitalism in particular Mm -hmm. I feel like one of my biggest blocks around money was um, misunderstanding money as being part of this like monolith of capitalism, which I didn't want to participate in. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to make money in a capitalistic way. And I didn't want to spend money in a capitalistic way. And so I didn't know how to deal with this thing in the middle that was money and so just felt really frozen about it and for me I was the opposite as you in that I never hoarded money it was like as soon as I received it because I felt so uncomfortable holding money Mm -hmm. I would just let it go and so it didn't matter how much money I was making I would find excuses to not hang on to it Because I felt like if I made money, if I gave myself permission to make money, then I was being capitalistic. And looking back on it now, like I see how when my nervous system was in sympathetic, and I talk about this a lot of like when your nervous system is in sympathetic, you're in binary mode. Mm -hmm. And so everything becomes like a this or that. And there was no room for nuance. And Now, having worked through so many of these ideas, the most anti-capitalistic revolutionary thing that you can do is to heal your relationship to money so that you're receiving money in Mm -hmm. a healthy and aligned and values driven and loving way. And so therefore, when you spend the money, you're also looking to spend your money 
in a values driven, aligned and loving way. Mm -hmm. And my receiving habits and my spending habits has changed completely since I have embraced this relationship with money as being the portal to some really, really deeply confronting medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The way that we create money and the way we release money can have massive effects on how we feel about it because we can definitely, as we say, vote with your wallet kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can promote what you want want to see more of in the world through what, how you create and release it. And mm -hmm. also, you know, you can stop certain things by not participating. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it is 2022 and we all need money to survive at least these days. So, yeah. 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 And I think that there's a part of me still that feels like Oh, but I am just one tiny human. Oh, yeah. How <laughs> can, you know, how can, you know, me choosing to buy a organic apple at the store versus a conventional apple, how is that going to change the tides? And um, I was chatting with, with Andre several months back, producer Andre, who's also my best friend, um, and he was like, he shared this story with me of in the 90s, shrimp became like the most popular thing ever. Um, and so what China, what China did is they recognized this like international market of people who wanted to eat shrimp. And so they flooded their rice fields and farmed shrimp instead of rice. And for the first time in history, China had to import rice to feed their people. And so, like, that makes me think about, like, you know, it wasn't just this, like, gigantic population of people who were trying to eat shrimp in the United States that drove China to go buy more rice. It was a collection of individual people mm -hmm. who made that that choice sitting at dinner you know going and shopping for groceries and being like oh I want shrimp for dinner or you know I want shrimp for my meal and it was the collection of so many of these small seemingly minute decisions that moved China to go buy rice for the first time yeah well not only do we vote with our wallet, but also making a decision not to buy certain things or to buy certain things, a decision to buy an organic apple. Think about the energetics that went through you and the healing that went through you and the awareness that is also not only manifests in you buying an apple, but also manifests in you spreading that to the people all the, all the lives that you touch because mm -hmm. with your healing and your energetic balance you give that to others as well whether you're coaching them or whether you're, they're your friends or by leading by example or talking about it in your podcast or like an, on, a, on a smaller scale so it really is like a little like a domino effect if one person changes a small thing there's a massive it will create massive resonance in the world Mm -hmm. Maybe not immediately, but it is the beginning. So even though yeah. seemingly it's nothing, what's one person buying an organic apple or one family deciding not to have shrimp? But then it's it's the effort and the the awareness and the thinking of it and thinking about others. That's the bigger picture of it, like yeah. considering how our choices actually affect the world around us and also being aware of what we value again back to values what we value and what we want our dollars to go towards our money to mm -hmm. go towards because mm -hmm. again values dollars voting all of that so it's not just like this small thing it has a massive effect on the collective yeah yeah absolutely and i think 
and I and I imagine that this is the same for you, but for me, the reason why I feel so inspired to work with spiritual entrepreneurs and for you working with creatives who want to live unconventional lives, you know, I I think about the person who is then going to spend that money. Mm-hmm. And so I want every single one of my spiritual entrepreneurs to have a successful business because I trust that person to spend that money that is much more in alignment with their values than so many of the money holders in the world right now. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so like yep. I I a want people to unlock the medicine that's within them and live their life purpose and like you were saying everybody is born with a gift that they're meant to share with the world um but that unboxing happens within yourself first mm-hmm. but then if we think about the ripple effect of somebody who is now being given the responsibility of holding that money and holding a portion of that money from you know however much is floating around in the collective and you get to make a decision with that money how that person decides to spend their money is going to be so different from how a corporation is going to spend that money Mm -hmm. or how somebody who hasn't healed their money wounds is going to spend that money and i want an entire fucking army of (laughs) of spiritual entrepreneurs out there spending their hard earned money. Actually, I don't even want to say hard earned. Yeah. I was going to say like hard earned. I don't like that. We were saying, um, yesterday I had a coaching session with Kat and also earlier went before we hit record, we were talking about, I mean, the, the definition of success for spiritual entrepreneurs is so fucking different to what we grew up with as a definition of success. Because like you were saying, definition of success, the house in the suburb, the white picket fence, you know, the perfect smile, uh, wife or partner or husband and like the children and the dog and like that photo that you send around for Christmas. I mean, that's not success for us. Mm -hmm. Success for us is something very different. And you know what? I think it depends on the person as well. And yeah. that's nor- let's normalize that. Let's normalize how success is no longer measured by how many people follow you or how much money you make or how much, 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 you know, that, that metric number. Yeah. Let's normalize talking about success in a different way. Why don't we talk about internal success first? And I do, I do acknowledge that we do need some kind of money to survive in the world. And that's another piece of the coin, like another side of the coin. But for our internal fulfillment and success, let's start looking at it from the inside out, not from the outside in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And when you start looking at that from the inside out, you know, you may end up choosing to to purchase that white picket yeah. fence around the house, but it's done in your full sovereignty. Exactly. Exactly. And it's done from a space where you are making that decision and you're not um, externalizing that decision to society to make for you. And so exactly. the energy that you buy that house with is going to be so different from the energy that you might have bought the house with pre-money wound exploration. 100 million percent. Um, Yeah, that's a number in my books, 100 million. Okay, because I decided that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, there's I'm not poo-pooing the white picket fence and the suburban house and all that. These are all great. But the energy by which you do this thing will tell you what that thing will mean to you. Yeah. It's all Absolutely. about the energy you put into it. I mean, we can, me and Jane, who's Jane? I don't know. <laughs> we can both buy the same house in the same street or like neighbors or whatever. But what's the difference between when you buy something out of alignment and love versus, fuck, my mother-in-law told me I have to buy this house. So I'm buying this house. I fucking hate yeah. this house. We both have, you know, similar houses, but look at the difference. Look at the energy. Yeah, Exactly. I, I think I just want to inspire more people to make decisions that feel like way more empowered and alignment for them. I want to 
really invite people to do this deep shadow work around money because the energy that you recirculate that money with is going to look so, so different. And that is going to help shape what this next generation, what our future looks like. Um, And so, you know, take the invitation or leave it, but it's there. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like we, we have a massive power to leave the world a better place than where, how we found it or how it is right now. And that has nothing to do with whether you want to procreate yourself or not, but you are creating in every second, every minute, every hour of the day, you are creating something and just becoming more aware of that creation and the energy by which you create is going to change the world. I promise you it will Mm -hmm. seem small, but it will change everything on mm-hmm. the long run mm-hmm. and healing money wounds definitely is an act of rebellion absolutely what makes businesses succeed or fail and i want to hear your take on this so from my point of view it is being clear on what success means to you as an individual and becoming very clear that the measures of or milestones of success that we grew up with or that are conventional don't apply to you anymore, like we were saying. Just um, releasing yourself or liberating yourself from the confines of these milestones or these um, outside measures is a very important thing so redefining success as it looks and means to you is one of the most important factors the other one is being clear on your values as a business owner your personal values and your business values as a spiritual entrepreneur i would think they will be pretty much the same they could be a little bit different because it's a business and you might have employees and all of that, but I feel like they will all stem from the same, you know, root. So being clear on your values and understanding how your choices are either supporting these values or not supporting these values. So that is what I call my no bullshit filter of making financial and energetic choices. Um, and the other thing, and I believe, <laughs> I'm, I know I learned that from working with you or through working with you is having the right intention and having the aligned action to support that intention and not just like I'm doing it I don't know what I'm doing it but I'm doing it it's more like I'm doing it because so if we go back to yin and yang masculine feminine energy you know having that intention and the masculine energy which is needed springs from that intention with you know it's balanced and It has a purpose. It's not just like doing for the sake of doing, like busy work. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that came to me yesterday was boundaries. Mm. Boundaries is such a big, 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 big thing, especially for spiritual entrepreneurs, because, you know, we we have a gift, right? So the reason why we start a business is for many reasons, honestly, like we want to break free from from all of the (laughs) stifling systems that we grew up with. We want to make a difference. We want to create an impact. We want to change lives. But it's mostly because we have a gift, right? We have a gift to give. And that goes back to perhaps our life purpose. You know, we're we're creating our life purpose in the 3D world through the business. But the thing that I used to be very guilty of and I'm trying trying to be very intentional about is that you are given the gift. You know, that gift is your innate pr- gift from God, from the universe, just because you are beautiful and you are perfect. As you are, you have a gift. It doesn't mean you have to give that gift away. It's your gift to give and you give it away in a way that suits your boundaries, your, your nervous system, back to the nervous system, um, a way that makes you feel safe, a way that doesn't overexert you or puts you in that martyr kind of like archetype of like, I'm just going to give, 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 and I'm not going to like worry about myself because that will make you resent your business. Mm-hmm. Because when you're 
giving too much, you are going to, or when you're giving from a money wound as well, you're going to end up resenting your business. You're going to end up resenting your clients. You're going to end up undercharging. You're going to end up like just spending the money um, carelessly or hoarding the money because that's where you get your sense of um, accomplishment or your sense of security is like, oh, I have a big savings account and I'm not going to do anything with that money because I'm so scared or whatever it is. And I'm not making fun of you. That's I'm making fun of myself. <laughs> That's how I used to think. But like having, um, you know, just like having these boundaries that are placed in your in your business by having clear boundaries. And it's not boundaries against people. It's boundaries for yourself because yes. we all know that we overdo it. Important distinction. Yeah. It's not like they're the enemy. It's more like, okay, these are my boundaries. And the other thing with holding boundaries is that there is a certain dignity and grace when you honor your own promises to yourself. Mm-hmm. Whether it's the smallest thing, like I'm going to have a glass of water first thing in the morning or I'm going to do yoga first thing or not look at my phone, whatever it is, like it's a small promise you do to yourself. When you fulfill that promise to yourself day in and day out, you build this resiliency and grace around you that you cannot get from the outside. Yes. That is my, this is as far as I've gone so far (laughs) to answer that question. (laughs) I mean, you know, I would love your answer, obviously, if you want to share it or you want to, you know, expand on anything I mentioned. Yeah, I think it's, an expansion on what you've talked about already and maybe even pulling it back even further to define what success and failure is in business Mm -hmm. because I think that so many times we look at success and failure as being this quantifiable thing that you report to the IRS at the end of the year Um, and I think that success and failure is to me determined by how is your business serving you in your life and so you might be making a hundred thousand dollars a year but you are doing work that doesn't feel feel, feel fulfilling so then you go home and then you drink and you feel like you need to numb all these different areas of pain and the business even though it is successful by you know typical cultural and IRS standards it's not actually a success if it is pulling you away from the core of who you are and how you want to express yourself in this life. Beautifully said. Yep. Yep. And so I would even go so far as to say success is about building a business that supports the life that you lead instead of the other way around. And I think the cliche way to, to, to think about this is like, do you need a vacation away from your business? You know, And thinking about like, oh, I do this, like similar to how you were sharing earlier of like, I work and work and work and work and then I go travel. So it's like your business and your, your vacation, you are like two very, very separate Mm -hmm. people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And versus the kind of business that I think about as being successful is like, you get to show up as you in every aspect of your life without, you know, diluting any part of you because the business is such a authentic expression of who you are. And I think that that's where like my people live in terms of like the spiritual entrepreneurial space is like, is your business not just a thing that makes you money, but is it a thing that actually is this living, breathing, relational piece of you that is one aspect of this bigger whole, right? And it's a true expression of this bigness of who you are. And I think that that's um, done through these methods that you were just sharing in terms of 
being in line with your values and being in line with your intentions and holding boundaries. And um, I think that that's the how to get to the business uh, that's successful. But I think that I needed to just like rewind the tape a little bit and really define like what a successful business actually just is. Because I think that people even just struggle with defining that. I am high on cat's wisdom right now. I'm like <laughs> flying. <gasps> oh, that was really nice. <laughs> oh, that was yummy. Yep. I think we need to put that in a sound bite and just like play it as a jingle in the world, you know? It's <laughs> a very, very long jingle. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, that was so satisfying to hear. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that. your answer too, you know? And I, I feel like I've had the honor of like watching your business evolve um, in the time that we've known each other. And honestly, the closer and closer you get to your true self, and this is true for me too, the closer mm -hmm. and closer I get to my true self, like it only can affect the business in, in this positive way. You know what? I think... It's no, I think I know that this is applicable to all our relationships because mm. what defines Same a romantic way. relationship? What defines a successful friendship? It is when you are 100% you safe mm. to express you. And why would your, dif your business be a, a corporation or like a box where you go in and out of your business is also a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. I love that. Yeah, so it's, I think, success in life in general, not just in business, is the ability and the safety to be fully you, warts and all. Like, that includes your wounds. That includes wounds you have integrated or not integrated yet. Like, yeah. where they're all welcome to the party. Yeah. yeah. And just feeling safe to express that and being weird and being wacko and being whatever the fuck you want to be. And not feeling like you need to apologize for being yourself. Mm -hmm. That is safety to me personally. Yeah. Yeah. It's me too. I love it. <laughs> what a luxury to be, to be mm -hmm. ourselves. It really is. It is. It is. <gasps> it's a luxury and it's... A necessity. Yeah. And it's, it comes from hard work. It does, doesn't it? It really, <laughs> really does. It's... You know, I, 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 I'm just having flashbacks for when I was a kid, you know, family get togethers. I would be the person that just puts music on and dances in the corner nonstop. Like I would miss dinner. I would miss everything because I'm just dancing it out. And people are like, Nadine, you can't do that. Nadine, that's impolite. Nadine, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, OK, so I have to kind of recondition myself and do what these older people are telling me because that's what's right, making myself wrong. And then only to like fast forward 30 years later, and I'm like, she was right. Why the hell did I did it take me 30 years to go back to my real self? I could have just gone with that. But obviously we don't know that as kids, right? Yeah. And you needed to survive your family, you know, yep. and surviving your family meant that you had to conform and fit in to a certain extent. And I think that we all carry those wounds in one form or another. 100 percent yeah yeah yep. and so having the forgiveness <laughs> and the gratitude to the little girl who was like okay i'll fit in because she yep. helped you survive yep <laughs> yeah absolutely just like imagining how i could have just been that crazy girl dancing in the corner my whole life <laughs> i would have landed where i am now <laughs> joking <laughs> mm. If you're listening, I hope you can understand now why I was like, okay, I can't host a workshop about money without inviting Nadine on to be a part of it. So this workshop that we are going to be getting into is called The Energetics of Money. It's going to be on June 25th through 26th. And... We're really going to be talking about the yin and the yang aspects of money. And so Nadine and I are going to be covering the yin aspects, which is really about the energetics 
Uh, Nadine's going to share some of her work around the archetypes of money. Uh, and so if you want to drop in and just give us a little bit of a sneak peek, that would be wonderful. Um, but then we go into some of the technicalities of money. And so um, wanting to work through some of these money blocks so that you can accept the like to do list of how to set up your business. And I have Tiffany and Beth from Kenza Collective, and they have this really, really beautiful outline of things that you can set up in your business. I wish I had had this, this list um, when I was first starting out as well of like, these are just the things that you need to do on the technical level of making sure that your business is like financially secure. So, you know, it's going to be a little bit of energy work, it's going to be a little bit of technical work. And Nadine, I would love to hear just like a little bit of like a teaser about your archetype work. I'm so excited about this workshop. Just Kat talking about it and describing it on this podcast episode makes my mouth water. I don't know about you guys out there. I am a money nerd, but it really sounds awesome. And I also wish I had that checklist when I first started the business because, I mean, you know, there's not a lot out there that is aligned with spiritual entrepreneurs. So thank you for, you know, creating this workshop for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, for my segment, my teaching segment, I would love to start to talk about how our um, behaviors around money are not, they were not created from the ether. They, mm -hmm. You overspend or you oversave or you put your head in the sand when it comes to money or you have financial anxiety, not because you are defective or you're missing the money gene. It is because of your money wounds. So all our patterns and behaviors around money in our adult life are informed from, from our childhood before the age of seven. Even so many people think, oh, is it when I first started making money? Is it when I started making an allowance? Actually, it's really not. It's between the ages of, I mean, two and 12, but definitely at age seven. That is when we started absorbing information about our core beliefs. This is when they were formed. This is when we absorbed information about money. This is when um, it was about like scarcity and abundance and all of these things and worth. Oh, that's a big one. All of these little things, all these little nuggets came together and like piled up together to create your core beliefs around money. So I'm going to talk about what our money wounds look like as an adult. And I'm going to dive into money energetics in terms of archetypes. So archetypes, money archetypes, the ones I use at least, we, they were created by my own mentor, Deborah Price from the Money Coaching Institute. And I found that as the best tool out there to understand our energy behind money or the energy behind our reactions and behaviors around money in a way that will help us understand them, not demonize them. Mm -hmm. It humanizes these behaviors because even if these behaviors are sabotaging you now, they protected you at some stage in your life. They no longer serve you now. However, we need to understand their origin and how they were created so that we can holistically break the pattern. So I will be going through that. I'll be talking about the eight money types or the eight money archetypes because they're in all of us. Um, so I'll be diving deep into that and how we can take that knowledge from our archetypes and spring forward into more alignment with our money. Mm -hmm. So that's just a very, very surface level overview of what yeah. I am going to be covering. Yeah, it's beautiful. I'm so excited. I've um, taken your money archetypes quiz on your website. And, you know, I feel like I have like a surface level understanding of like what these these archetypes mean. But I'm really excited to to get into the meaty, juicy bits of it. Yeah. And um, just as like a little bit of an overview of what I'll be sharing is really like it goes so beautifully hand in hand with what Nadine is going to be sharing because we are going to go into your belief systems and understand where your beliefs come from 
and I use a tool in my own practice called the belief triangle and it's a inquiry practice it's also a journaling practice and so using that as a tool to access where these core beliefs may have come from and how we can untangle and unravel them because I never want to just bring you to a point of awareness I want to actually help you move through what that is and um, I will also be doing a bit of live coaching on the workshop. Nadine will also be doing a couple of live money archetype readings with Tiffany and um, with Beth. They will walk you through exactly how to set yourself up. Um, and so this is a really, really comprehensive program that honestly, like I designed it because it's something that I wish I had had. 10 years ago <laughs> you know I look at folks oh who are on their money journey and I'm like oh can I just give you the shortcut like I just want to help just push you to that next level because like we said you know when more and more conscious aligned people are spending their money in ways that are aligned like it's going to change the world and I just want us to get there <laughs> so Poems. that's You're speaking poetry to me yeah <laughs> so this is this is why um we're putting this out and it is set at a, an investment of 188 dollars and so if you would like to learn more all that information is on my website www.empoweredcuriosity.com and i really encourage you to show up and and join us it's going to be a really really fun weekend yeah, it's going to be so, so cool. And that's funny because I feel like as spiritual entrepreneurs, we the work that we put out there is partially work that we that our past selves wish 100%. that. 100%. Right? <laughs> you know, if like that day I was in New Orleans and I had that massive awakening, like money awakening, spiritual awakening, if I found my program and went through it, it would have saved me six years of yeah. agony. Yeah, I feel the same you know? way. Yeah, yeah. I wish I had my program six years ago because yeah. it would have saved time. And the thing is, like, when you wake up to money as not just that this, like, black and white thing, you make it, you spend it. It's more of, like, an energy. You kind of feel alone. And it's so nice to be in a community that is going through the same things that you're going through exactly. it is validating and it's also healing to heal in a community mm -hmm. so i really encourage you all if you feel called to to join us because there is there are people out there that think like you that feel like you and you're not alone and mm -hmm. you know you'll you'll meet them <laughs> you'll meet them all and you'll meet us and yeah. it'll be so cool yeah we'll just have to do like a big virtual cuddle puddle hug <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll just meet in white sands. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, loves. Uh, again, the information, www.empoweredcuriosity.com. And thank you so much, Nadine. Before we log off, can you please share how people can find you as an individual, not just sure. as a workshop co-host? <laughs> <laughs> So um, I am very active on Instagram. My Instagram handle is at save a million cents. My website is also www.savealmilliancents.com. Um, yeah, if you have any questions or if you want to do the archetype quiz, it's also on my website. Just shoot me a DM or shoot me an email. All the information is on there. And yeah, that's about that's how you find me. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thanks for being here, Nadine. Thanks for having me and giving me the space to offer my perspective on this uh, prickly and beautiful topic. <laughs> Yay!